Hi, welcome back to Wild Speculation. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. This week we talk about Critical Role Campaign 2, Episode 110, Dinner with the Devil. Yep. Uh, good episode. Yeah. A lot of underneath the surface things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I... I appreciated the uh, regardless, irregardless, unregardless. Yeah, decay of the empire uh, comments. Um, uh, shoot. Um, and we did get to see uh, both your calls, which. I think everyone pretty much agreed with as far as Caleb's spells yeah. that he took for his level were used. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was super happy about that. Um, and we also saw I, I enjoyed Jester getting a bit of Uncle Iroh um, yeah. wisdom. Yeah. Like when they only Caleb confesses. Yeah, they only have from one source. Uh, you have it from many. Mm -hmm. um, I I like the Rip Van Widow guest joke. Yeah. Uh, which led Caleb to, you know, not all of you know. Yeah, which I touched on last week. That, yeah. Hey, this is who knows. This is how much who knows. This is who doesn't know shit. Yep. Um, Jester hugs him. Yep. Sort of gives him dispensation. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily forgiveness, but she definitely gave him understanding. And she certainly forgave him for any lies that he feels guilty yeah. about. Um, although she did so without fully understanding, which you see unfold yeah. as that scene sort of progresses. And her trying to lead him to, to tell her you were being controlled. Tell me, yeah. tell me your situation is like Yasha's. I think, and then, and he didn't and wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and that because he wasn't but yeah um, at the same time I thought it was very poignant to character growth and I think I don't know if Liam did it without thinking about it but I think Caleb did it without thinking about it if that makes sense and that was, he says, he said, I was a different person then. And Bo points that out to yeah, him. That's the first time you've ever admitted you were someone. You were someone else, that you're not that guy anymore. Yeah. And I, I think that was a huge step in growth for the character. Like I said, I, I think Liam probably intentionally said that. But I don't think Caleb intentionally said I was a different person. Because he's still yeah. struggling with being that person. Yeah. Well, and he was doing it as an answer to Jester's questions about, well, were you being controlled or not? Mm -hmm. um, so, we'll see. And Matt uh, was totally wrapped up in Liam's performance. Yeah. Um, I think and, a few of the players were too. Like yeah. Travis and the, the ones who weren't talking were just kind of sitting back and like, oh, wow. Yeah, but there's... Matt always listens yes. when they are talking, when the players are doing their thing. He doesn't check out. He always, he's always engaged. But I noticed on my rewatch that 
If you watch Matt during that first segment when Caleb was talking to everybody, Matt is really transfixed on Liam. Mm -hmm. And every now and then, his eyes dart to the camera. Yeah. And when they're not darting to the camera, he seems to be looking over to Marisha. Um, and she was the one that was most back and forth with Caleb in yeah. the scene. So it yeah, kind of made it sense. Was, it was her and Jester that were yeah, kind of leading the discussion. Um, and I think he can see Jester looking towards Liam. Um, but, yeah, it was... I, I wanted to, to call attention to how engrossed Matt was in what Liam was saying. And I think... I, I don't know if we'll ever get an answer to this, but I think... That informed the dinner scene. All right, we're going to have to turn my phone off because I forgot to. Sorry, everybody. I need to remind you. But yeah, um, I think it colored his performances at the dinner. Um, Possibly. Yeah. I um, mean, it, it may have tinged a few things in the conversations, but I think that it was too little too late to have a huge impact on the characters. I think Matt would have already known where these characters are and Yeah, but I so. think I think that the scene that Liam was in, mm -hmm. I think that played into some of the subtle things that Matt did to highlight how Astrid and Abe Wolf came up with their own coping mechanisms. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't know. Because um, I could just... It was more than just enjoyment that... I think Matt more was... Yeah, I think more of anything it affected um, Astrid. Because it seemed like she had a much different personality than the other times we've seen her. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it wasn't... It was more underlined with empathy and a common bond rather than underlined with cold calculating bitch. Yeah. That we've seen before. Yeah. Um, but... They went back, so they, I, they could have gone shopping then, but they didn't. No, nope, they went straight back. Yep. Uh, and invaded Casa Bernardo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They visit Beth and... Nugget makes an appearance. So, we've talked the last several weeks about Beth and Yaza and... She's going to stay, she's going to go, and Yeza's totally on board with her, you know. I got a succinct impression that Yeza is not as okay with the adventuring as he's been letting on. I, th I think he wants to support her, but he gets so anxiety-filled Every time they mention anything, and I know it's partly to protect Luke, but he's seeing these people. I mean, he watches Bo try to give him. He's like, these people are a bad influence on my family. I, I don't think he's I, as okay with I think he supports her, but he's not as okay with it as he tells her he is. I will not argue that at all. <laughs> I think that's 100% correct. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to point that out and I also want to point out 
And I kind of had to go back and rewatch a couple of scenes in previous episodes. But since they've rescued him, every time the whole group comes around, he excuses himself. He's always got some, uh, getting to go get more food. Let me go to do this. He always has to go excuse himself, get himself together. Like, what the hell is going on? You don't think that's just Matt giving the scene to his players? No. Because he could just be standing there. He doesn't have to say anything. It's true. But he makes a point. I mean, giving the scene to the players, he could just, yes, it starts cooking. Yeah. As you talk. But he always makes it a point, I'm going to, I'll be right back. So either it's population anxiety, too many people around. I think, well, that could be it. Or he's uncomfortable with a bunch of tall people around. Yeah. Um, there's, I, I don't believe this to be the case, but since we're wild speculations there, um, and I'm sorry, I will get you the name to put in our show notes for like the YouTube stuff details, but there's a Redditor who made the comment that when that happened in this episode, her husband turned around and said, he has a spy because he always excuses himself. And the theory was that. He's going out contacting someone so they know to scry on him so they can watch the Mighty Nine. And then there was this debate as to whether it was Jorhas and they broke him in his time there, or if it's part of the service assembly because Ludinus and Vestrugna were the ones that were working with him in Felderwin. I don't think that's I, I don't think that's it either, but this is wild speculations. I'm gonna throw it out there. We will put in the description the name of the redditor that had that theory. Uh, but I, I I think it's I think it's uncomfortableness with and I think it's with the Mighty Nine specifically. I, I think he's doesn't make a big deal about it because he's grateful they saved him. They reunited him with his wife. Um, however, he feels they're a bad influence on his family. That's possible. I also think he is a terribly shy man because that's what Beth told us he was. Yeah. And I think it has more to do with he doesn't like crowds of people. And crowds of people are even bigger when they're all taller than you are. Um, I could see that to a point. But when it's the six people who saved your life, you'd think you'd be a little more... I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. And in some ways, the way that they treated him was not dissimilar. Because he was still basically a prisoner while they were in Jorhas. And they basically left him alone. And yeah. he, he did some things around the house while he was there. But other than that, he's... I think he's just a very shy and quiet man and he doesn't like things coming in if that makes sense he, he he seems to be the kind of guy person who has things a certain way wants them a, a certain way yeah and these chaotic people like if they hadn't saved him he probably would tell them to get the fuck out of the house uh, but they saved him, they take care of his wife, and that 500 gold she pulled out of her pouch is nothing. She's got thousands of gold. Oh, yeah. That she hasn't given him. And I've been wait. I was actually waiting for that 
to come up for Sam to say, I dump X amount. Yeah. Let's buy a chest. Boom. It, 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 and it's just allowance. <sighs> By the way, one gold a day is a modest lifestyle. So that's more than a year's worth of lifestyle that she just handed him. Um, and she just got told, by the way, you're going to get about 10,000 more. We're going up north. Yeah. Uh, with 10,000 gold, Yeza can build an alchemy school. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah. But we finally get the canonical age of Luke. Yes. Which cleared which, it up for Sam and everyone else. Yeah, which it, it was weird because I remember him saying it was like, you know, around that age, yeah. way back when they first met Luke. Yeah. When she was still a goblin, before they had freed Yaza. Yeah. When she did the, you know, disguise self and went and knocked yeah. on the door. But then they've all been treating him like he was, you know, between seven and ten. And. And he kind of acted like it, you know? Well, yeah, he acted yeah. older than a four-year-old. Well, arguably, when you thought your mother died and your father was kidnapped from you. Yeah. And you had to move across the country. You tend to mature. That That is a good point. Um... Uh. Jester looks in on Lord Sharp. Yep. Which is the first time she's done that. Mm hmm. Do you think that's her way of trying to, of realizing she can't really come home until she actually deals with that situation? I think it's her way of trying to find out if what she's done has dealt with that situation or if she needs to do more. Fair. Um, uh, I did like Sam leaning over. Talison, what was it like growing up as Luke? Uh, yeah. Uh, and while the crew is in Nicodranas, uh, Caduceus goes to cast Word of Recall at the Temple of the Wild Hunter. Yep. The Divine Save Points. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then Caleb asks to see Jester's room. Yes. And when he did this, I was like, oh my gosh. And we talked about this earlier, but... And because I was as sure as you were that the mansion was one of the things he was setting up, I was like, he's one upping the unicorn. He, you know, he's about he's prepping to upstage the unicorn trinket from Forge. He's going to give her her room wherever they are. Uh, yeah, I had not thought of that angle. Um, it makes much more sense. Uh, and puts it in a clearer context that that was his motivation. Um, I am 99% sold that when he describes the mansion in the next episode, he is going to say, and Jester, this room is for you, and it's going to be a copy of her room. Yeah. I think... Now, Scanlan didn't have a courtyard. But I think Liam's is going to have a courtyard. Okay. And I think that's where Caduceus' room is going to be. I can see that. Uh, I think Ford is probably going to have a nautical-themed room, if I had to guess. Yeah. Uh, Bo is probably going to have hers look like the chambers that she was given at the Cobalt Reserve in Zadash. Um, with perhaps a little more of 
her family's mansion thrown in. Some of the core that he witnessed from there. Um, See, I was thinking for Bo, like, just a, a room with, like, an area with, like, training dummies, but then also, like, a little bookshelf library thing. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, Veth will probably have some version of the apartments. <laughs> Everything made out of a no. Buttons acrylic into the floor. So she can't actually pick them up. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but my biggest widow jest moment of the episode, apart from him asking to see her room, because that was sort of my ooh, widow jest. Yeah. Uh, was when she invites him into her bed. Yep. Uh, and I was kind of like, Haha, Ford didn't get that invitation. Um, but, uh, and then Nugget punishes mom yep. by peeing on her bed. And no one has prestidigitation. Nope. <laughs> And both like, Caduceus, clean it up. How? Like, thaumaturgy. <laughs> the window's shut. No, 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 the smell is bad. The windows are open. Like, press the digitation is how you clean it up. I do kind of wish Ford had actually cast Eldritch Blast. <laughs> <laughs> and then Caleb spends the rest of the night just bending her bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah. I I'm waiting for Nugget to disappear. You know, for a while I kinda of thought he had because yeah. there was a couple of Back to Nick and he's not around. And he's not around. Yeah. And then all of a sudden he was again. I think that's just Matt forgetting that the dog was there. Yeah. I think it is, too. Just like he forgets that the weasel's in her coat. Yeah. I like, how does Nugget, how do Nugget and Weasel get along? Well, one, only one of them's alive. <laughs> it's a chew toy. <laughs> uh, but they get, they have their night. Yep. Go back to Rex and Trim. Via the teleportation circles. Yeah. Bo stays behind to do some research and get herself outfitted. Yep. Uh, through the soul. And they go off to shop. Yep. Well, trying on the clothes montage. Yep. Uh, Travis pretends like he doesn't care about these kind of things. And he was sort of making a... Uh, Got the coat? I take the coat. <laughs> yeah. But my understanding is he was the most picky as to the design of his armor. Yeah. And so attached to that design... That he transferred to magic enchantment rather than switching armors. Yes. Yep. So while he may pretend that he's not into all this stuff, he totally is. He is just, I think, when Laura gets excited and she's getting to basically play paper dolls outfits, uh, I think that is what, I think he puts on those airs. Uh, to balance? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, that and there's also the possibility that he really doesn't care about the coat or like cold weather stuff. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, it could be like me. I usually like with my characters, I'm like pretty picky with their whole general look at the beginning, but then adding stuff like cold weather, like I don't want to go design a whole new outfit mm -hmm. for them. I just 
get the stuff and just assume I get stuff that accents Matches, what I already yeah. have and don't want to go into a whole lot of thought process about it after that. You know, that's what I do. Yeah, that's fair. He could be the same way. Yeah. Um, they have some discussion also leading up to the dinner, what do we expect? And then we get to the dinner. Mm -hmm. And Caduceus, right out the gate, is the diplomat. Yep. Uh, Which Vesh, makes sense. He's the most even kill of the Mighty Knight. Well, he also has the most siblings. True. Uh, and he knows that what Veth and Yasha are doing is the kind of stuff that sparks fights. And that's not what we're here to do. Right. So he does the opposite. He tries to keep Plan G, Plan G. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I love that in that scene, in that moment. Um, and then the dinner, the conversation begins in earnest. Yeah. Once everyone is seated. And Trent opens with what brought you all together. What motivates your... Mm -hmm. adventuring and there was a slight pause and I think some self-reflection of damn we should have a, an answer for this and they settled on justice yeah Beth speaks up and which I don't think is why no I, I mean Beth did her little spiel and ended on justice and Caleb makes the side comment I think we just want to leave the world better than we found it. Yeah. And Trent says, well, then we're on the same side. Or something that we, yeah. we think alike, basically. Yeah. Our we're goals not, are we're not so different. Yeah. And then they sort of try to question his use of his power. But he says, and one of the things he says is, what is power good for, if not yeah. to make it better? Yeah. Which set well, the. Yeah, uh, says something about. Yeah, what else, other, what else would you do with power than, you know? Yeah. He doesn't necessarily say make it better, but he said something about its intended use. Yeah. Because uh, he never directly, you know, Caduceus points out, he never directly answers a question. Yeah. He never, he always well, just sidestepping everything. And if there's any NPC in this campaign that sort of personifies the path to hell and paved with good intentions. Might be Trent. Second only to Essen. Uh, um, I, 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 I'm not convinced Trent's intentions are good. I think he builds them as good. I think his intentions are selfish. I think from his point of view, they are good. Again, he can justify it that way, but that you can justify something doesn't make it that thing. <laughs> True. Um, uh, but we sort of get Trent's view into the assembly politics. Yes. And I'm trying to build a map with incomplete information. But I think what we have is Ormid Haas is loosely allied with Vesterovna. Okay. And they are aligned against Ludinus, the left, and Trent Dickenbach. And I think Trent actually wants to take Ludinus's place. And I think Trent's game is he dangles himself as the bait to get Caleb hooked into the political machinations of the assembly. I can see that. And then aims him at lewdness. And, yeah. and says, look, what I did to you, because he's already, he's already told Caleb I did it for love. And I did it with your parents' permission, essentially, is yeah. what he implied. 
your parents said, do whatever it takes. Yeah. But who really pulled the trigger on my program is Ludius. Yeah. I was just following orders. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and if he can get Caleb to take a Ludinus, he can take Ludinus's place. And then he can say to Caleb, well, you can have my place. And Which maybe is why eventually. When they asked, you know, what ha how do you lose your, you know, you, yeah. you die, you resign, or you, you know. You're replaced, yeah. And. Yeah. So I. And I think I was right that the dinner was Trent testing the loyalty of Abel and Astrid. Because, and it, this is from Astrid's perspective, when Caleb is saying, when last we spoke, you s implied that you were looking at this position. Yeah. And she's like, mm. yeah. And, of course, Trent just leans forward and he's doing the best Emperor Palpatine, Sith Lord. Yes. Rule of two. Uh, yes. Grooming your underlings for you. As I have in my notes, Trent Sidious. Yes. <laughs> Although I do like the, the Burns reference that Matt made. Yeah. He's always been kind of like the complexion of Mr. Burns. Yeah. Uh, we saw some new sides and return to old habits in the dinner. Yeah. Uh, we saw a new side of Jester mm -hmm. with her mean girl coming yep. out. And we talked about what was her interactions with Astrid going to be vis a vis any relationship yeah, that she was said going to be any cattiness? Yeah. And apparently there was. Apparently. Uh, now, she covered it with, I thought she was a bad person. Uh, yeah. I thought she was going to be a bad guy. Uh, but that doesn't hold much water because. In the conversation they had about what to expect at dinner, Caleb said, I think they can be saved. Yeah. He straight up argued with Bo, who wanted to, no, we just wipe them all out. He's like, no, I think they, they're not so bad. Yeah. So well, let's, let's talk about the, the Trinity, the trio there. Um, we've got Trent, who we established long ago from his first meeting with Yasha that he's most likely an enchanter wizard. Yeah. Uh, got Astrid, who, I don't know, did she strike you as an illusionist? Or? I actually think she is uh, evocation. Okay. Um, Although illusionist might be closer. Yeah, especially with the glamours. Well, and she implied that she can do more things with right. illusions. Like, if you work at it, you can do more with illusions, was basically yeah. what she said. So you, it, it might be illusionist. And then there's um, Ted and Wolf. And I don't, I don't know. Evoker, maybe? He might be the evoker. I actually think he's an Eldritch Knight. Eldritch Knight? Okay. Uh, Which would put him Evocation Abjuration. Yeah. No, I was thinking Evocation or Abjuration. I know. Uh, I know or he's he got could the be symbol. a War Wizard. He's got the symbol of the... The Raven Queen. The Raven Queen. Now, and I was thinking, and there, there's no, like, Divine Bent Wizard, which I wonder why that's not a subclass, because we have an arcane domain for clerics. Two different power sources. Well, if you can have an arcane domain for a divine magic user, why can't you have a divine school for an arcane? Because there's a god of magic. Exactly. Wizards just don't think that. Uh, you know, I mean, is, I think is he, is he a multi-class? My my big Does question: he have I don't know, or cleric, or 
warlock? Uh, I don't think so. Um, Liam certainly seemed to think that he was multi-class. I, I doubt it. Um, I think he's an Eldritch Knight. Or if he is a multi-class, my bet is on then uh, War Wizard Paladin. Um, not that there's a huge amount of synergy in right. that build. Um, but it gives him an extra AC boost. Mm -hmm. um, he could wear medium armor and get the AC boost, I think, because I don't think the reaction AC boost is dependent on you not wearing armor. I don't think so. I don't think there's any armor restriction on it. Um, so there's some synergy in that sense. And the extra spell slots from Wizard are nice to dump into Smites as a Paladin. Um, but I don't think it's a Paladin thing. I think his... Yeah, that's true, because if you're a War Wizard Paladin, you could use the shield. Okay, you can only cast Cantrip, but that doesn't mean you can't dump that spell into a Smite. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually pretty good. Yeah. I'm just going to use my cantrips for my spell attacks, throw up my extra AC, yeah. bash it with the extra dice. Yeah. Well, and um, well, okay, and an Eldritch Knight and Paladin also has some potential synergy in the sense that level 7, when you make a weapon attack, you can use a bonus action to cast a cantrip. Or no, it's the other way around. Cast a cantrip, bonus action attack. Mm -hmm. So, Green Flame Blade. Thing, bonus action attack, and on both those he can spend a divine smite. Yeah. Um. So there's some synergies there, but not. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a multi-class. I think it's just that that is how Aidwolf has processed the his actions. I think he glommed on to the fate aspect. Of the matron, and his parents were fated to mm. die. It was it was not his hand that did it; it was hers, wielded to make him this instrument for the empire. Yeah, uh, and that's why I think he remains loyal to Trent. Is because that's the outcome. And that would is. be why he said she keeps bringing us back together to Caleb. Yeah, I can see that. Um. Uh. So, yeah. Whereas Astrid has an outlook more similar to Caleb, but also, like, she has the outlook that Trent wanted Caleb to have, but she doesn't have the abilities that Caleb does. Yeah. I think her, her intelligence score is probably 16 or 18. Yeah. Uh, where his was high enough that he was going to get to a 20. Um, so, like in a lot of ways, she is what he wanted Caleb to be, but she is not powerful enough, um, to do what Trent wants, which I think is to take out Ludinus. Right. Um, uh. and she of course wants Trent's job. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I almost think it, if there is a multi-class, I think it's just a dip. Like a two-level fighter dip to get action surge. And... Well, I think if he has any fire, he's full Eldritch Knight. Okay. Um. Um, or he's a wizard and maybe a paladin dip. But I really think... I don't think Yep. Based on their Liam's talk of him, he's always been strong. He's always been, you know. Yeah. And he said that he's been more of a scout. That leads me more towards Elvish Knight um, than a full wizard. Yeah. Um, so. Um. But when I say that we had some return to forms, Ford provoking 
in order to learn. Mm -hmm. When he asks about the beacons, do you have how many beacons do you sure, have? How many beacons do you have? We had just the one. Well, um, he he says you saw the one. That's all we have, or that's what we have, not all we have. Because yeah. I was asking you, do you think they have more? And he's yeah. just giving the bare minimum information. And I think he was telling the truth. He does not. He is unaware that they have another beacon. Um, where and I think lewdness and uh, Vess know they do. Uh, and that's why I think there's a shell game happening because Vess is concerned with fighting members of the dynasty when they go north, and so. She is more in conflict with the dynasty, and that's sort of where lewdness has been this whole time. Yeah. Because lewdness, I think, can't get past ancient grudges between high elves and drought. Like, I think that's where he is in. Okay. We haven't had enough interactions with him, but I think that's where he's at. I can see that. Um, so anything to weaken the dynasty and strengthen the empire. That's what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. um, we also got proof that my speculation about him taking credit yeah. turned out to be true. Um, and Marisha called it out. This motherfucker. Uh, Comparing him to a tarot card reader. Uh, yeah. uh, the dinner very much had a uh, a history has its eyes on you kind of dinner where Trent has offered him a shot is is he going to take it or not yeah. um and the like the the biggest gut punch was Trent implying all of their parents asked for it, yeah, not just Caleb. Caleb's. Uh, and cherry on top, he said that they were nothing. Yeah. Uh. So he definitely doesn't view it as any waste or problem uh, that happened. Um, but once again, Taliesin has my favorite line of the episode. Yeah. And I almost wanted to give him MVP for this. Yeah. He says, you're a fool. Pain doesn't make people. It's love that makes people. The pain is inconsequential. It's love that saves them. And you would know that, but you have no one around you. Yeah, you have none around you. You said yourself, you surrounded yourself with deceit. And then the, the final uh, dunk. I wish for you in the future that you will find someone who will mourn you when you are gone. Yep. That's like the perfect group. Like that, those few sentences of dialogue just encapsulate Caduceus. Yep. As uh, like everything that we've seen of him distilled into one interaction with somebody. And it was beautiful. I loved it. Um, but. So we could give Caleb MVP, but I think that's unfair because we're sort of in Caleb's backstory. So he's going to have the lion's share of the attention. Well, he had the attention. I don't know how much he progressed things, though. 
yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and Caduceus kept them focused. Caduceus kept them focused, and he had that line. Well, and he's like, you know, this is, we should have a goal, not a grudge. Like, he's he's steering them. Yeah. I I, I was split between him and Marisha. And Marisha uh, at the end. Well, especially. In, well, at the end especially, but, I mean, she kind of... That, that first scene we talked about where Caleb's confessing and, you know, Jester hugs him and everything. And she's the one that says, this is the first time you've... She kind of moves that into a growth moment. She kind of guides that conversation, even though she wasn't a huge part of it. Yeah. You know, I mean, she was, but she wasn't. You know, it, it was it was a Caleb thing with a little bit of Jester and a little bit of Bo. Yeah. But she what she did in that moved it. Yeah. And then... You know, she, when they get back, she's the one that says, hey, let's go visit Beth. Not that they weren't going to do that anyway, but she kind of pursued that. Yeah. And then when they got back, you know, she she did the study setting up for where they're going. I don't count that because they already got all that information, basically, from Vess. I mean, all that did was give her a second source to okay. clarify that Vess wasn't lying. That's all that did for me. Okay. Um, um, I mean, I guess that's fair. But, but the reason I give her MVP is at the end when she's going through her notes. Yep. And she's saying, look, Nonagon, Lucian, the Eyes of Nine, his tattoos... Going up north, yeah, the, like uh, tomb takers. That was the name. She's going through all of her notes. So everything that like Marisha is good as a player for came together, yeah, at the end of this episode and and clarified everything for all the players. Okay. We've been talking about this here, stuff forever. Here, here's a question for you. So they get through all this and they talk about Cree and Molly and Jester's like, hey, Dad, can you get Cree? We need to talk to her. And he's like, she's been gone for months. And she's like, well, wait, I know Cree. Let me call Cree. Calls Cree. Cree's response. Now, it's very poignant because you're known to the person you send the message to. And... While it was brief, the fact that as a blood clerk she took a sample of Jester's blood, as a friend of Molly, she interacted with that whole group. That's a memorable thing. It's not something you just forget. And had no clue who Jester was. Did Cree pull a Molly? No, I think Cree was lying. Okay. I think. Cree was hiding from whoever Molly was. Like, Cree was afraid. And they were all afraid of the woman that performed the ritual. Think which I think from was Vess. Molly was? I think she's hiding from Vess. Okay, from Vess. Okay. And that can make sense, too, because she is a blood cleric. The Tomb Takers are a sect broken off from the Claret Order. But... Um, and this is in the Tal'Dori because it's got more information on the Claret Order in there. But the Claret Order, one of their main enemies from when they were founded is the Dwendalian Empire. Um, because basically Dwendalian Empire and um, a place, I forget the name of the other place, were at war and the king made a deal to expel the Duendalian Empire from their land, but it filled it with, like, undead and stuff. And then a priest that was there prayed to the Raven Queen and got the blood magic, which allowed them to fight against all these undead and stuff. Mm. Um, so they had blame for this guy and for the Duendalian Empire, and so those are their two main enemies. The Duendalian Empire is, like, 
So they were the tomb takers because they are still part of the cleric order. They're just like a, a subsect, you know, a, a different denomination, if you will. Um, one of their enemies is the Dwendalian Empire. Yeah. So creeping with the gentleman in the Dwendalian Empire puts her at risk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I think I think she is following her own investigation into the death of Molly. And like how Molly's story was not over, I think it has been happening in the background. Oh yeah. And I think we may see Cree in the north. Okay. I would I wouldn't doubt that. Um I don't know, I just think if the Eyes of Nine have anything to do with what's happening with up north with Molly's tattoos, yeah. Kree's going to be following those same leads and she's going to be up north. Um, and I think she was in a position not to be able to speak. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why she didn't respond. Um, although, if she was running from Vess, and Vess did get her hands on her, modified memory we have seen used before. Do we have? So you may also not be wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple other things real quick. Um, we are almost halfway to getting information on Sabian. Because we were told a month, right? When Ford made the deal. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned it. Yeah. I said almost. So that was at the beginning of the Exodus, which was a week before TravelerCon. So that's one week down. Then we've had a few days, oh, and we're in the middle yes. of a week going to where they take off north. When they take off north, it'll be just over two weeks from when he made that deal. That's so true. we are almost halfway to getting the information about Sabian. Well, the expected timetable yes. that she gave him. Whether that's realistic and whether or not he will get a report in that time uh, is yet to be seen. Yeah. Uh, it has to be said, uh, Tosh Omni on YouTube mentioned that she doesn't think, they don't think that Matt is going to do a scene for Ford's Oath. Yeah. And this is our third episode. Since, yeah, I was, think you're right. Taken. I don't think we're gonna see a scene. Um, we're gonna have to wait till he uses an ability from an oath to figure out what oath he is. Okay. I I'm still holding out hope. Um, that it happens, but it is seeming less and less likely. Yeah. Um. It's possible that. He swore it already. Because if you remember in the vision that he had when he switched patrons mm -hmm. and took his level of paladin, she made him swear to protect the wild places and her followers. Yeah. And if that's the case, it's probably Oath of Ancients. But if that's what that was, why did Travis say, I'll have to get with okay. you about... Um, I'm, uh, I'm grasping at straws here. I don't know. I'm just, I'm putting it out there. 
the, for the purposes I, of... I, 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 see, I think that was kind of making the, the pact for the Warlock levels, because the at, Warlock at, levels yeah. are now... And at the time, that was my interpretation as well. I'm just trying to retroactively make an excuse why Matt hasn't made this a, yeah. a, a narrative point. Um, and, and I mean, it could be that they talked and he decided on Oath of the Agents and Matt said, hey, we can just use that. Yeah. If you don't want to do a whole other big thing. That's true. But um, I don't think in the moment it was intended as that. Uh, yeah, not exactly. It, it may have retroactively become that, but yeah, we won't know until either an oath scene happens or he uses an ability. Yeah, channel divinity, really. Yeah. Um, or a spell that's not normally on the totem list that's on yeah. the oath list. But that's a little noodly because some of them Yeah, some of them are paladin spells. Yeah, you just always get it prepared. Yeah. It does not when you have to. Um, yeah. Um, I did write down Blood Magic, Blood War. Just It's kind of hitting again. We've talked about the Blood Magic before, especially with Molly and, you know, Kree. We just talked about that and the Blood War, you know, the demons and stuff. But... It just, and then I was remembering, you know, uh, there was the one place they kept getting, I can't remember the Ash Keeper Peaks. Yeah. The, um, the garrison there. Yeah. And we, you know, I had taught, speculated that maybe there's going to be some kind of, you know, it's a battle for some kind of huge blood sacrifice. There's so much blood has to be spilled. It just seems to be like the manacles, like the slavery, one of those underlying themes. Well, if we're right, and though we've been speculating since episode one of this show, and episode one of this campaign, uh, that the final big boss mm -hmm. is going to be a Tarask, a mountain range on the border between the Empire and the Dynasty, is a damn convenient place for the Tarask to be. Yeah. And for them to be fighting over control mm -hmm. of that to ensure that it's not used against them. Yeah, either side doesn't want that. Send it down to the Lobos Court. Yeah, <laughs> let it wreck the beaches. <laughs> sorry, Jester. Sorry, Ford. Uh, but also, like, it could be just the blood soaking into the earth could very well be the thing that, like, an alternate way for Matt to awaken it. Yeah, other than whatever ritual is going to happen. Um, tough, yeah, tough in the air. I also considered that, that one of the flying cities escaped to the Astral Sea. Yeah. Um, we don't have enough information, but that is a possibility. Um, we would have to have an accurate count of how many there were and an accurate count of how many ruins have been found. In order to say it's a possibility yeah. or a probability, yeah. Because if like if there were seven flying cities and only five sets of ruins, then there's a fair chance that it could be right. If there were ten, and and I think I think we I don't remember how many there are, but I think we know of four ruins. Uh, Aor, um, what crashed in as a uh, uh, Rex and Trim? Uh, um, Draconia was one of them. It just lasted longer and ended up crashing during the Chrome oh, Conflict, yeah, but it right. was one. That's right. Um, so we know of that one. Um, and then the one that crashed in the Elven City yeah. that Rainy was right. going to. So it's the four. Yeah. But I don't remember how many there were overall. Um, 
Well, that might have been Draconia that was still existing. But yeah, it's it's possible. And actually, it might be probable because I think that's one of the reasons why, if Vess is who was trying to get the Eyes of Nine with the Molly and everything, mm -hmm. I think if that is the case, then that's probably true. Yeah. That that city is a city that crossed over. Yeah. Um, or that may have been corrupted by Mind Flayers eons ago, and it was, or it came to this plane from there and then went back. Yeah. Um, Re regardless. Uh, things that we shall find uh, on the trip north, which I am reticent to say is going to happen next episode. <laughs> Mm, yeah, <laughs> we're at least going to. We're at least getting the tour of the mansion. Oh, Zadash! We're yeah. going to Zadash to see the gentleman. Okay, so yeah, um, we're definitely not going north. Yeah, yet, so no. Uh, we will see you guys next week, though. Yep. Bye, guys.